we also get the option to choose how we're going to partition. Now, as a general rule, until you become extremely familiar with the Linux partitioning tools, I recommend you let the installer automatically perform the partition. Otherwise, you can choose Red Hat's favorite, Disk Druid, or a common standard of FDisk. It's basically going to give us a couple of options that say we can either drop all Linux partitions, all partitions, including all non-Linux partitions, and any partitions that are using the hard drive can stay, and we can use any existing free space. On some of the newer Linux distributions, you can actually choose to make room for the Linux install if you're trying to dual boot with an alternate operating system. If we have multiple hard drives, we can choose which one to perform the installation against. This option allows you to actually go through and see on the next screen what changes are going to be made to the drive itself. This is basically going to give us a heads up. You're getting ready to destroy all Linux partitions on the system. We're going to agree to that and move forward. This screen allows us to look at the various partitions that are going to be created for us. As you can see, we're going to get a boot partition containing our boot files at 47 megabytes. We're going to have SDA2, which is going to house our operating system and any additional user files that are necessary. And finally, our swap partition. Now, your swap partition is comparable to the Linux page file. It's almost always going to be twice the size of your physical RAM. In this example, I'm using 128 megabytes of RAM, therefore it's doubling that and giving me a 250 meg partition. We also have the option to choose our boot method and what we're going to allow to control the boot process. By default, we're going to use Grub. And that's actually my recommend as well. We can also choose not to install a bootloader if we plan to use a boot disk. But if you don't install a bootloader, it's going to use any other boot method that it can. And if you're dual booting with Windows, that means Windows will always boot, and you'll never get the option to go to Linux unless you use that boot disk. We can also choose where we want to install the bootloader. By default, we're going to the MBR. We can also choose to the first sector of the boot partition. We can also pass any specific kernel parameters, allowing us to boot into special levels of the Linux operating system. And if you plan on installing the bootloader or booting from any particular logical block addresses higher than the 1024th sector of the drive, then you're going to want to select this option. Very rarely will you ever have a need to do that. We get to name the operating system boot option. So if you have any specific names for your operating system, you can choose that here. But that won't have any effect on the functionality of the system. And finally, it's going to show us where the actual operating system files are going to live. And that's going to be on SDA2 of your primary drive. As we mentioned before, we have the option to choose the grub password. And usually you won't do that unless you're trying to perform a fairly secure installation. This is only going to secure a local attack against your system. So as long as you have pretty good physical security, this won't be necessary. Our network configuration, by default, is going to be automatically activated and configured using DHCP. Normally, this is the desired configuration, unless you're on a network with a static configuration, and then you can make those adjustments by simply deselecting to configure DHCP. We also get the option to choose our firewall configuration. By default, we're going to be looking at medium, only allowing incoming DHCP requests. And basically, that's going to be for advertisements for DHCP servers on the network. As a general rule, you never want to configure no firewall unless you're just playing around and testing things out. Under any circumstances, you always want to have a firewall. You can also allow other incoming protocols, such as SSH, Telnet, and FTP, and some other options. Generally, this is only used in a server environment. You don't want your individual clients allowing connections through SSH or FTP. If we want to configure any additional language support, we can do that at this point. 
And there are many variations of each language to choose from. We get to check our time zone, which is basically going to allow for automatic configuration of your time based on time changes and based on location. Now, because I'm in the central time zone, I'm going to choose America, Chicago. Now, the root user is the administrator of the system, and it's going to require that we configure a password on it. So we'll go ahead and type that in now. And generally recommended is to create yourself an account so that you don't log in using the root account all the time. So we'll go ahead and set that up and move forward.